I'm Bailey Parnell, and this is Let's Think This Through. Join me for drinks as I bring on guests for conversations that inspire, amuse, and challenge us, but in a fun and relaxing kind of way. Ultimately, it's to help us all learn and live a better, easier life. So let's think this through. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of my show, Let's Think This Through, with me, Bailey Parnell. In my daily life, I get the absolute privilege of being able to think and speak and teach for a living, and I do share a lot of those thoughts online and in public ways, but I've just kind of felt that that version of me online, while still very much me, it just doesn't capture me at my most comfortable and my most chill. And I've actually even had friends tell me that my online presence doesn't capture like what they love about me. And if I'm being really honest, I kind of feel the same because even though I might be doing this on stages or the most formal of places doing this thinking where I actually have my best conversations is probably just over drinks. Like, you know what I mean? Like when we go out for coffee or tea or when I'm out for a cocktail or a mocktail with my friends or family or someone I've just met, these are the best conversations. We are relaxed. We can go on tangents. We can make some jokes. And of course, this is actually just how I was raised. If I think about it, what is the first thing that you're going to hear from me when you come into my home? Can I get you a drink? Now, because of my life and my work and You know, I really know, and I love people more importantly from all walks of life. So these conversations are always so different from each other, but they all inform who I am. And you know what? Dare I say, I actually think that they are above average conversations. I'm just convinced. Why? Because I don't think that you need a degree or money or a title to have your thoughts respected, to engage, or to want to learn. You just need to be you. So I wanted to create a space that is more authentic to me where I can invite people to just have a drink and share in a conversation that might make us all go, hmm, or laugh, or just be better humans. Where we walk away feeling like we've actually learned something or we feel enriched or empowered or something like this. So that's what you're going to get on this show. We're going to think together because I know that you are capable of more than you know. And you know what? We're going to do it over a drink. So for my first guest... I wanted to bring in my number one thinking buddy. This guy was the one who actually convinced me to start this show because over the summer, he looked at me straight and said, you know what? I think that you should do a podcast. I think you'd be good at it. And I think it would be interesting. And for some reason, it just clicked for me. You you know, when someone else sees possibilities for you that you just haven't imagined for yourself before. And you're just like, wait, yeah. Like, why didn't I think of that? I could, I could do this. Yeah. I would like to have these conversations. So you either have this guy to thank or to blame for me being in your ears right now. This guy, this guest is the one and only Hamza Khan, or as I like to refer to him in public, my husband, because in private, there are all kinds of assorted nicknames that make zero sense to anyone else. And if I'm being honest and true to form, I actually really did think this one through. Like, to have my husband as the first guest on this podcast, because at first I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm an empowered woman. I am an independent woman. Is it kind of uncool to bring my husband on for the first episode? Like, I don't need him. I can do this alone. And I legitimately thought to myself, okay, wait, Bailey, that sounds very third wave feminism. I actually thought that I don't need to prove that I can do this without a man. I already have. And I'm living fourth wave, y'all. So then I thought, and my girlfriend said it best to me when I told her this. She said, do what you want to do. And she's right. And Hamza is my biggest champion. And I think he's very interesting, though I am very biased on that one. And he really is the person that I think with most. So we are going to talk about all things podcasting. You're going to hear a bit about our relationship. It's just naturally. We're going to talk about getting ideas out there, expressing, and... We're going to let it go in any direction that it wants to go. So let's dive in. Hamza, welcome. Glad to be here, aka in the same space as you. (laughs) Well, not exactly the same space, but uh, besides being my husband, of course, how do you introduce yourself to the people these days? That's a good question. 
I have leaned into the multi-hyphenate descriptor of myself. I refer to myself as an author, a speaker, an educator, an entrepreneur. Let's just go with a multimedia, multifarious expressor of ideas and actions. Of course, absolutely, I know. But what are some of the ways that you express? Hmm. As a keynote speaker, as an author of two books, a third on the way, uh, as a teacher when I have an opportunity to hold court in a classroom, and I'm in the process of building my next business, which we might talk about. I think so, because as your wife, I want to tell everyone. I'm like, I know all the things <laughs> he's doing. Let the intrigue but, simmer for a bit. You are guest number one, so I also have hey. to let you talk. So then I told you to bring a drink and I'll tell every guest to have a drink with me. So what did you bring? Absolutely. But before I share that, can I just say, first of all, huge fan. <laughs> I don't think I've, I don't <laughs> I think I've so. ever actually said that publicly. Like, I think you know that I'm a huge fan of you uh, and I have the privilege of being with Aww. you all the time. And um, I'm just honored that you would select me from your very large and eclectic network to be guest number one. So like a sincere appreciation for that. Also that background, very familiar. Many people have seen yes. me with a similar background. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I remembered <laughs> uh, <laughs> Christian Bale's Bruce Wayne from I think the third Nolan Batman film where uh, he turns around and then Catwoman disappears with his uh, bat plane and he goes, so that's what that feels like. That's exactly what I thought when I saw that background. So that's what this feels like. Okay, sorry, long-winded answer. Nothing else than a Nolan <laughs> reference be... in the first three minutes. <laughs> References, quotes galore in this episode. I had to come in strong. Uh, and speaking of strong, coffee, of course. I was thinking about making a mocktail espresso martini, an espresso mocktini, if that makes sense. And uh, this cup is actually an homage to you, Bailey Parnell. Oh, it is sweet. a BU cup. There's a lot of things going on over here. It says Brazos River. That's the first thing that caught my eye. We're, of course, fans of the yellow verse. Um, <laughs> and I think Brazos would have been from, correct me if I'm wrong, 1932, 1886. 72. I don't know. There's a lot of years now. Know. The one with Sam Elliott, where he kept on saying the <laughs> Brazos. We're crossing the Brazos. So thank you for this cup. And uh, thank you for inviting me to share in a drink and conversation with you. I'm going to sip on this coffee. Usually I have a straw in here like a psychopath, but I decided yeah. to, you know, be a little somewhat normal for your audience. Keep it kind of cool in public. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. okay. Um, you know what? I, <laughs> for everyone who's listening, because you don't know the format of this yes, yet I will ask every guest to have a drink with me. And I'll also tell them that they can choose what kind of drink. Like, are we doing a coffee tea vibe or are we doing like, let's go out for cocktail mocktails kind of vibe. So Hamza, it is afternoon right now. I've also shown up with a coffee and it's cause you know, when you hit that afternoon slump yeah. and I don't do coffees in the morning anymore, as you know, but around two, three, I'm like, it's time for a little bit of caffeine. I can't go any later than that though. Let me but, ask you, Bailey, though, is this the mm -hmm. special Bailey coffee? Because I have unique access to your morning routine, and I know that there's a coffee that you make in the morning oh. that is basically a potion. Like you're a witch just standing <laughs> in front of a cauldron, mixing all these ingredients, frog legs in there, teeth. That I don't know what goes no into problem. it, but is this the special tea? coffee? <laughs> I don't tea? Know. Hey, no. That, I feel like it would be a very potent asking. ingredient then. <laughs> That is not coffee in the morning anymore, actually. Oh, that yeah, mud water. Is what's My bad. <laughs> it's called Sorry, mud water, and there are water. various types of chocolates. And let's see, I think it's like the base is actually chai, and there's a bunch of different kinds of mushrooms in there, and it is a coffee <laughs> replacement. But I did not Damn. show up with that today. So, But, of course, as you've noted, we obviously live together. We're married. But yeah. we are not in the same frame right now. So tell the people where you are and why. I'm down the hall in our tiny New York apartment in Studio B. Well, technically it's Studio A one A. If you're no, I don't know. It's it's not a it's not a separate room. It's just literally down the hall from you. Uh, in our kitchen, actually. I decided to get a nicer background than if we were to record this cramped together in the studio. I discovered a new word recently. It's a word that I'm trying to use in a sentence, so I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I think of myself as an asthete. 
that sounds really weird coming out of my mouth, but it's A E S T H E T E, and it means a lover of aesthetics. And so I thought it would be very important, especially that there's a, especially given that there's a video component to this podcast, to make sure that uh, this is as visually appealing as we can make it, given the uh, the the space constraints. Mm-hmm. And I actually got that from yes. the Oppenheimer screenplay. Shout out to Asma for that. Oh, yes. Um, Hamza got a very special Secret Santa gift. And this is the most Hamza kind of gift that of that one would ask for. And do you want to say what it is? Yes, yes. The complete screenplay of Oppenheimer, a film that I have watched 13 times in IMAX. And I'm not sure, probably north of 25 in total. Obsessed. We can do a whole podcast on just yeah. that. Yeah. I think we could, and I will at some point, because if there's anything that I think through a lot, it's definitely film and television. Bring a physicist, bring a nuclear scientist, bring anyone who is tangentially related to the film, and bring me in as a fly on the wall. I will ask like two questions, I promise, and I'll just geek out mm-hmm. for the rest. Absolutely, because you and those are the kind of things that we talk about a lot, and actually you were the one who <laughs> encouraged me to start this podcast in the first place. And Mm -hmm. earlier, I, the people heard from me that you're the one this summer that looked at me and said, you should do this. I think you'd be good at it. And I think it would be interesting. And for some reason, it was just maybe timing in life, but it just hit like an epiphany for me. Yeah. Why couldn't I do this alone? These are the real kinds of conversations that I get to have with my friends and I love it and I want to do it more. And so what a beautiful way to do it and to start with you. But I am curious. Why did you think I should do this? Because either people are thanking you or blaming you right now. <laughs> hey, if, <laughs> if you're blaming me for this, uh, you know, stick it out. I promise you, it's only going to get better. Uh, you're already off to a roaring start. You are a natural. And I think that people like yourself who have a passion for this, who have a gift of expression and uh, are able to refract their world and reify the world for others have an obligation, perhaps a moral obligation, to not die with their music still inside them. I think I'm paraphrasing Wayne Dyer when I say that. I hope I'm getting that right. We can add this to the show notes, but uh, Wayne Dyer is quoted with saying, don't die with your music still inside you. And uh, man, you have so many gifts to share with the world. Uh, You have your network, which is a very eclectic, large, interesting network that is oriented towards the greatest good. We're talking about every walk of life, every race, religion, gender, sexuality represented. I mean, just the full spectrum of the human experience is reflected in the people that I get to experience through you and that are basically NPCs in my life. Um, Then (laughs) I think you also have the gift of your insights. You are one of one. You're unique. Uh, All of your insights are tested in the crucibles of academia, but also in business. They're very practical. You make your insights very accessible. And uh, I promised myself I wouldn't get emotional, but it was like not a real promise. Don't get emotional. uh, It's going to happen, man. It's going to happen. I. (laughs) You're going to get emo. It hasn't even been ten minutes yet. (laughs) One hundred percent, man. I'm. As I approach 2024, it is the year of Hamza being more Hamza, and part of that is. Uh, you know, accepting that I I went through an emo phase and I never actually got out of it. I just suppressed it for a while. (laughs) So there's also your light. Um, you're, you're buoyant, you're, you're charismatic, you're, you're funny. Uh, and, and you're, you're warm. Like I said earlier, you have a unique personality. You're one of one. You have a lot to say, a lot to offer the world. And I think, this format in particular is conducive to you expressing yourself, expressing your ideas and your utility to humanity freely and fully. Damn. Well, Send me that's a check very for nice. That. There we go. Of course, I know, right? It's like it's like hearing my vows all over again. I'm like, yeah, I ought to ask you this when I wake up in the morning. Like, wait, if you send me a check, it would I get should... me in trouble with our accountants, though. Don't do that. Also, wake up in the morning and say, hey, why do you think I should start a podcast? But, you know, one thing that you said to me this summer that stood out was, and I really agreed, was that people are not seeing the sides of me that actually make that network like like me. I don't know how to say it, but myself too. Like what I enjoy most about myself with other people or when I'm hanging out with my friends, I don't feel like that side of me is really being communicated online. And, and it's, 
that's probably why I sometimes resent creating social media content. Like that is a version of me, no doubt, but it just feels like it's not my most comfortable and chill self. And so I'm wondering for you, what is the side of you that people are not seeing online? Because you have an online presence and obviously wow. I have theories as your wife, but I'm wondering like, what do you think it is that people are really not seeing about you? Yeah, as, as you were saying that, I was just reminding myself that last night I paused Oppenheimer, I think I'm like 28th watch now, uh, on the mm -hmm. pivotal scene midway through the movie where his friend Robbie says, be yourself, only better. And then there's that crescendo, Ludwig Grants and score just kicks in, American Prometheus. And then you see him like, you know, dust off his suit, put on the pork pie hat. And it's just like, whew, my goodness, uh, it, it, it's triumph porn, if you will. Seeing that scene, uh, I thought to myself just a few moments ago, I'm like, hey, like Bailey is exactly herself right now. All your friends, all your family who are listening to this know that the Bailey that's presenting herself in this podcast episode is the exact same Bailey. We're having the exact same conversation that we would have. It's just turned up like one or two notches. We are ourselves only better. I am animated, clearly. I'm dressed better than I am clearly than I am normally clearly um, maybe I'm 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 a little more funny maybe I'm a little more charismatic but that's because I think we have an obligation for the audience who's gifting us their time their energy and their attention with this uh, uh, exchange of, of information to be as present for them as we would be for any organization any audience that is seeking our time so I just want Agreed. to say like you are yourself right now but people are seeing the explorer they're seeing the student they're seeing the person they're seeing the curious side the humble side the human side of bailey it's just it's now it's now getting past that barrier that i think some people have when they're interacting with bailey in the wild where given how you present yourself i think sometimes you run the risk of appearing too polished to the point where it might feel disingenuous and inaccessible but it's never not inviting well, that is very sweet of you, but I'm wondering I hope so. about you. It felt like an insult at the end, but it was a compliment. I promise you. No, 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 not at all. Not at all. I, you know, like we've talked about this. I feel exactly yeah. the same way that when I'm out in the world talking about, we talk about very serious things, but I don't actually take myself very seriously. And I don't think yeah. that part's got out, out there, but enough about me. They will hear sure, from sure. me for a very long time. If I, they I continue have so listening. many more compliments for you if you let me go, <laughs> but sorry. Yeah, you're cute. But hey. <laughs> what is the side of you that people are not seeing online? Because like I said, you are also yeah, yeah, a public yeah. persona. Like I live with Hums, but everyone else sees Hums a con. So yes. what are they not seeing? I mean, straight up, they're not seeing me, period. I, I have been uh, <laughs> engaged in a period or I, I have been uh, uh, um, proliferating radio silence across my networks and um, that's both intentional but also a reaction and we can talk about that later and so I'm just now thinking about how I want to show up in a way that's going to give me energy because I think so much of the way I've presented myself online was in an effort to appear for others and there was so much pouring from me that uh, I was left with nothing at the end I edited myself to the extent where there was almost nothing left so now I'm shoring up all the things that I loved about how I expressed myself online and offline over the last decade and I'm thinking about a way to package that part of this new package or the same package with a new bow on it is going to be reintroducing a side of me that only my closest friends know and maybe very intuitive people in my audiences know across media and across platforms and across stages is that I'm an artist. That's how I actually began this journey. And uh, it's Leonardo da Vinci who said great art or just art in general. Maybe I'm giving myself a little too much credit here because you saw my <laughs> painting recently. It was good. It was not great. By the way, if you have it, pretty you good. Can right over here. There you go. As, as, I, as I share this quote, I'll just say that uh, Leonardo da Vinci said, art is never finished. It is merely abandoned. And I began this journey two decades ago as an artist, as a creative, as somebody engaged in multimedia art, graphic design, uh, sketching, uh, you know, uh, illustrating comics, um, you know, video editing. Um, I mean, there's just so much. It was it was all, it was all mediums. Mm -hmm. And then things got paused for a very long time. And I went down this journey of academia, of entrepreneurship, and I'm grateful for every milestone, every experience, but I have gotten away 
from creating things from my soul, creating things for myself. And so that's what I want to bring back. That's the side of me that I don't think people have seen, but is there. And um, I've kept it on ice. I, I practice it increasingly so every single day. I freestyle here, I write poems there, I sketch here, I painted recently with you in the skills camp and safe social team. And so I'm feeling a pull towards the art. It'll give me a chance to express these, this bubbling of ideas and um, imaginations that are just not finding a home on the page of the book that I'm writing. They're not finding a place in my keynotes. They're not finding a place on podcasts. The only medium for them is something that's liberated from the constraints of the audience creator dynamic. I just need to do things for I myself. I totally again. see that. No, I do mm -hmm. see that. And when you say like that, I actually think back to early days when I met you and you were the one who was always drawing, like even before we were together, yeah. you always had, um, you're such a good drawer as well. Thank you, man. And um, I definitely think that there's like, you are the best poet for sure, but I don't think That's people see that side of you. I have to wear my, uh, my, my, my already prof poet shirt. Oh, yes. Yes, I call Poppins this shirt. I'm the cool prof shirt. Hey, I'll go with that too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's very eclectic, but it's really cute. And it's got lots of fun things on it. Shout out to MB but, and Leah. <laughs> so why did you stop then? I mean, you I remember also, you know, I've heard lots of stories from friends long before I even knew you, you had a media production company and you were making videos and films with your friends. And then you had the drawing, then you had the graphic design. Yeah, so yeah. like you said you put it on ice, but why? Life. Um, the demands of uh, a career that needed more design than art. And the distinction for me is simple. Art is something you do for yourself. Design is something you do for others. And so I found myself introduced to and then getting deeper into a system, um, a system composed of clients, of audiences, of subscribers, and all the different ways in which people receive what I create that needed design more than they needed art. They needed things for themselves. And I was only too happy to oblige, but it's been nearly 10 years of just giving and not asking for anything in return. So that's really why I put it on ice. I think it was a combination of circumstance. It was a combination of uh, not knowing that I could create art at this point in my life. If and when, I should not even say if, when I decide to more intentionally create art, I will be actually breaking a pattern in my family tree. I will be the first hmm. person. I mean, maybe there's some ancestors and there's no record of it. And we can, that's another story for another time, why there's very little records for the mm -hmm. uh, family that brought me here to this particular podcast, this moment in time. But I think I will be the first one to actually deviate from the path of working for a living. And uh, maybe I'll be creating for a living. And maybe I would even divorce myself from creating for any purpose other than to create. That's what I'm looking forward to. Can I pull that off in my lifetime? Can I get to a place where I just create from a place of pure freedom and love? Yeah, do you know what? I think that there's probably a lot of people listening, you know, even in our extended family that have this form of expression in their life. Like I can even think of, I have sisters that you know, who are so creative and they express through every kind of crafting and painting and anything that you can think of. And my dad has written poems my whole life. He told us stories when we were younger that were, should have been children's books. Mm -hmm. My mom too, of course, you know her and all the whether it was Christmas ornaments or painting yeah. or paint pours or all this stuff. I mean, they have all this art, but then I think you're right. I think if I asked some of them, like, are you an artist or what do you create? I don't know if they would have an immediate answer. And I think there's probably a lot of people that put that part of them on ice. Like, why do you think that yeah. is? Oh, man. I mean, it goes back to what I shared from earlier, Wayne Dyer, right? Don't die with your music still inside you. And I think that there's something about mortality. There's something about going through a near-death experience that really illuminates the fragility of life and the need to create and bring something from your soul and engage in the spiritual act of transforming whatever it is, is top of mind for you that uh, is you and you know, putting it out in, in the world for you to observe, for others to observe. And, you know, uh, you, you're, you're bringing up Bridget, um, your mom, my mother-in-law. It was really quite something for me to witness 
near the end of her life that uh, she became hyper aware that there was music inside of her and she gifted us with so much art mm-hmm. at the end truly oh, beautiful yeah, so true. And, yeah absolutely and another person who inspired me has actually been um from nbp that you referenced earlier he did such a dramatic transition early in his career like he was going down the path of becoming an accountant and said screw it this is not me living out my values he actually just abandoned the practice abandoned further education in that field and just followed his heart and went into vfx went into editing went into the other side of film now is it still design technically yes but given the gradient of the people that were part of nbp early and how we're expressing ourselves now he certainly is engaged in the most art adjacent practice every single day he is living out his purpose day in and day out and i see it like he's a different person he's happy he's he's got the light that you have he's got the light that i'm chasing some context here so everyone um nbp who is nbp they are hamza's (laughs) group of guy friends that he's had their entire life there's like 12 or 13 of them let's go man and the reason why they're called NBP, because I thought it was MVP for like the first three years of dating. We feel like MVPs, but, man. <laughs> you, you are. But NBP stands for, do you want to tell them? No Budget Productions. And it was an embarrassing <laughs> name back then, but now I say it with my chest, baby, because that really just speaks <laughs> to the spirit, the hustle, the desire to be A1, the desire to be five star. I mean, that was just the perfect interplay between the right people in the right environment at the right time. Like that was an energy. And uh, hey man, shout out to Leonardo da Vinci. Art is never finished, it's merely abandoned. I have every intention to revive NBP in one form or another. It's there as a friend group, it's there as a brotherhood, but it needs to come back as a vessel for expression. Yeah, and you know what? Um, I had just seen recently on Instagram, I think it was from Hassan Minhaj. He said that, hey. you know, all so many guys have a group of their guys and it has a special yeah. name. And of I course, laughed man. because I'm like, oh my gosh, Hamza has all these chats named NEP. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. for Different everyone flavors. listening, Bin is the nickname of Usama, who is actually <laughs> oh, a magnificent man. VFX artist, works on yeah. all of the top films that you know of from the last yeah. few years. Yeah. And uh, he's someone I would say, though, that didn't put their expression <laughs> on ice. He like took it off yeah. ice. But why do you it. think yeah. people like, you know, members of my family or, you know, you right now, actually, like, why do so many people put their art on ice? Mm hmm. Like, I, I don't know how, how deep to go with this, but. Uh, Listen, evidence by the name of this, I like to think through everything. So you could go as deep yeah, as you yeah, want, yeah. as light as you want. Let, let me start really high. Circumstance. That's the reason why most people stop. And I think mm-hmm. circumstance reflects the interplay between, again, the individual and the environment. I think an individual is oriented towards exploration, creativity, love. I mean, just observe babies. Babies are the perfect template. If you want to know what humanity is striving to do, just observe a baby in their natural environment. A baby is trying to run around, trying to break things, trying to open things, trying to grow, create, explore, laugh, and just have a full human experience. But it's the circumstance dictated by people either accepting, neglecting, or provoking environmental factors that ultimately prevent people from finishing their art, from even venturing into production of art in the first place. That's honestly why I stopped. I stopped because I had bills to pay. I stopped because I was following a Mm -hmm. blueprint that was created long before I was born about what it takes to succeed in North America, the first generation child of Indian immigrant Muslim parents. you know, capitalism, like how deep do you want to go with this? Mm-hmm. The, it, it's again, it's it's the circumstance that prevents people from realizing their art. And I challenge all the listeners right now to think about what's preventing you from creating art and removability from this because like you, you were creative. If you don't think of yourself as creative, I challenge you to maybe dig up if your parents saved them, your guardian saved them, or if you've saved them, something that you created when you were younger beautiful, brilliant, Oscar worthy, right? Um, Mm -hmm. You you choose the medium, you choose the award. What you created, you felt so deeply connected to. It was so pure. But why did you stop? Was it school? 
Was it a relationship? Was it because you moved? Was it because you burned out? Was it because you had bills to pay? Was it because you suffered an injury that uh, you know left you unable to create the art? It's circumstance, always. That's the common denominator that prevents people from uh, realizing their art fully. That's at least how I feel about it. But of course, I realize when I get passion, passionate about these ideas, I tend to develop, develop a very sort of single-minded idea of it. And maybe there's some blind spots that need to be illuminated here. Bailey, what do you think? Why do people put their art on ice? No, I think everything you said is absolutely like part of the systemic reasons. It's because, uh, yeah. you know, well, period, everything you said. And um, there's also, I think, elements of us as, as people that, you know, you compare yourself. You think that even though you really love singing and making music, that as you got older, you realize, oh, some people do this in a really big platform. Some, oh, right. I'm not a star who goes and performs at these bars every night. So therefore I'm not a singer or right, whatever right. it might be. Or, you know, even that example I just gave was tied up with more maybe traditional forms of art and expression. And so mm -hmm. then maybe they don't see what they do in their deck work as the most amazing form of art. And I do see it that way. I see if, you know, if you have this idea that you want to affect on the world and you express it and it becomes a deck in the end, like literally a back porch type of deck, that is art. Yeah. It is a form of expression that has changed the world. But, you know, maybe it's also part of like social comparison in people's minds and yeah. um, just thinking that I'm not that good. So therefore, I'm, I'm not an artist type of thing, too. Mm -hmm. So they just give up on the dream mm -hmm. versus, mm -hmm. you know, Maybe that's a separate thing is thinking that it has to be the full thing you do to see yourself as an artist, like tied up with profession, you right. know? Let me ask you this. You asked me some personal questions here. You have obviously the closest access to me and uh, my, my inner, you know, inner workings. Why do you think I have been reluctant to publish art? Well. I ask you the questions because I'm the host of this thing. Fair enough. Fair but, enough. Hey, I stand corrected. But I obviously have an opinion on everything. So <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. I think that for you, it has a lot to do with social comparison, actually. That's not why I said mm -hmm. it. But now that I'm like yeah, putting yeah. two and two together, I'm thinking, you know, Hamza, the designer or who did graphic design or then became the speaker or then was kind of the CEO and the business person and the marketer, maybe it just didn't feel like either for your side, maybe it didn't feel like it aligned with that persona and, or maybe because you were feeling not so confident in other areas of your life, maybe you also weren't feeling confident in say your poetry anymore. Um, mm. even though all of your friends would compliment it, even though, even like when you do spoken word, it's the most beautiful and everyone else will think it's good. You don't think it's good. And wow. the other thing was, um, oh, not just, you know, you seeing it as being in line with your persona, but perhaps you thought that others would not be able to compute. Can you be a CEO, marketer, business persona in the tech space? who's also like to give yourself some credit, a Muslim Indian man whom mm. then is also, you know, does spoken word and poetry and drawing and yeah, design. Yeah. Like can others compute those complexities and those identities overlapping? And honestly, there are some people that I don't think that they can right now, but you being you will show them that they can. That's, that's my thoughts right now. Yeah. Wow, man. <laughs> You dissected the, the shit out of that. <laughs> that was, Listen, uh, this is just regular on, dinner man. conversation for us. <laughs> well, this is, <laughs> this is honestly this. the push that I need. I, 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 I asked that question. I'm actually like taking a second to process that answer. It's I've been avoiding that. And I think that that which we most need to find is often where we're least willing to look. And the truth is I have been having a hard time reconciling the context switching necessary mm -hmm. for pure production of art in order for me at this point in my life to truly create art from a place of power and freedom i'll have to actually carve out some dedicated time in which i'm not engaged in commerce in which i don't have to answer emails i don't have to respond to briefs and hop on client calls and work on decks and do presentations i mean i love all of that mm -hmm. but i like i said i'm feeling a calling towards art and in order to get into the optimal mindset to produce the art that i know is in my soul i'm actually gonna have to put all of that on ice i'm gonna have to put that on ice 
and then create the art. I think I'm very sort of phased in that way, but it can be done. It can be done now, especially given the career that I enjoy, where I have these long stretches of time in between speaking engagements that are only becoming easier and more intuitive for me. So the prep, the preparation required for the work that I do right now is shrinking considerably. So I do anticipate in the next one to two years, I will find that period of time to create. But uh, I recognize the privilege involved in that. I don't know how I would engage in art were this four years ago when I was working at Student Life Network, were this you know seven years ago when I was running Splash Effect, were this nine years ago when mm-hmm. you know we were collaborating at TMU. Was that nine years ago? It feels like it was a lot longer ago. I don't but know. anyways, it was ages ago. Yeah. But uh, you know, for you, one of those things that you had was a podcast. Like speaking, you know, bringing it back to Facts. earlier, you mean you and me encouraging to do this. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Still have it. So why did you start that? Why did you stop it? Was it art? Was it design? I mean, yeah, why did yeah. you start wow. and stop? Let's start there. That is a really, really good segue, I got to say. I started it for very similar reasons to why you started it. It's because I was already having podcast-worthy discussions in private, sometimes in public, especially if they were happening on a fireside chat stage, if they were happening uh, you know, in a boardroom, if they were happening in a coffee shop. I was already asking questions born from genuine curiosity and interest in the subject or the persons, usually both, and people would be privy to those conversations. I've, I've literally had, you know, uh, in the double digits, people in public places who were sitting beside me and somebody else <laughs> actually like reach out and say like mid conversation or at the end being like, I was really into what you guys were talking about. Like, are you, are you a speaker? Are you, are you an author? Like, what do you do for a living? Like, because I think that mind your business or were you like, no, you definitely weren't. You definitely weren't. No, I I, I was honored, (laughs) man. I think you, you know, this better than anyone else. Like I, I describe myself as an intense person. Like I, I'm, I'm very intense. I'm very obsessed. Every person in my life gets 100% of me when we're together the cost of that unfortunately is that we do 100 percent, and then there's like a long lapse like months years but when we do reconnect it's pure love it's with the same interest probably greater interest now given the elapsed time but anyways let me let me summarize it because i realize i'm getting long-winded here no it's all I started right this because i'm the same I, way you know my okay, friends who have enough. stuck around for a very long time from from elementary high school university exact same as you you only stick around if we can go a while without seeing each other and it's exactly yeah. the same. And if you don't understand what I'm trying to do in this planet, how I'm trying to help people, what I'm trying to work for, you probably won't stick around in my day to day, but that doesn't mean I don't have love for you and I feel like you're exactly the same. So it's it's perfectly fine to take that little tangent. Fans of Bailey, you've been warned. Stick <laughs> <No>. around. <laughs> Stick around. Okay, but sorry. Yes. Let, let, okay, let me bring so this podcast. back to the podcast. Why did so you start I, and stop? I started this because it felt right. I felt like I was already doing this and there were people that I was already talking to. And I said, hey, rather than us meeting in person, just meet me in the studio. And that's what actually happened with George, with Astawa, with Mafuz, and people who I actually was going to talk to. I'm like, hey, let's actually just meet in the studio and have the conversation that we were going to have anyways. And it was fun. And it was play. It was not work. It was a great project with me, with Kwaku. Shout out to Kwaku, my OG (laughs) producer. And we just did a season of the podcast. And uh, in the beginning, man, we had like two listens, five downloads, and it was nothing. We didn't actually care about the metrics. But man, it's so true. We just kept at it. We were consistent and we banged out, I think, 25 episodes, something like that. And by the end, 2,000 listens, 5,000 downloads. I mean, it was gangbusters. Clearly, we found a formula that worked. That's and it worked good. so well. Thank you. It worked so well that uh, we started getting advertiser interest. We started getting to, uh, the, the weirdest email, and I can show this to you afterwards. I got an email from A&R at Bad Boy Records, which is the oh, no. record label no. that Did was that? started by and run by <laughs> a very, you know, a, 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 a pro- in 2023, a problematic figure by the name of Diddy. I think that's what he's going by these days um, in the news for okay, all the wrong but reasons. That's but, true, but check this but out. Like, probably young NBP would have thought, bad boy. Oh my God. What? <laughs> this is a guy who did Mo Money, Mo Problems, the D, the I, uh, the D. And I could just go down the I list, know, right? I know. Anyways, 
I get that email and it's like, hey, you know, this podcast is a good fit because of the blend of youth, hip hop, and uh, uh, you know, productivity, so on and so forth. We want to recommend the following guests for your podcast. We'll pay you to host them. And I was like, whoa, mm-hmm. this is so cool. And that was one of dozens of emails just like that from different brands and PR agencies. So here I am sitting down one night and I'm creating the list because I had to scrap the first list of season two guests. And the season two guests were composed of friends and family members and people that I was genuinely interested in speaking to. I scrapped that list. I'm like, hold on, we have a real cool opportunity before us. I started working on a list of influencers. I started working on a list of paid guests. I started working on a list of people that I thought would be good for the business of the podcast. I went to sleep and I looked at that list the next morning because it was late. And I looked at the list and I'm like, man, I know nothing about these people. I don't know who they are, what, if they're good storytellers, if they have something worth saying. I mean, for I believe everybody has something worth saying, but about the specific <laughs> topics that I was curating. And I looked at that mm-hmm. list and I'm like, man, this is starting to feel like work again. I care too much about the money. I care too much about the metrics. I care too much about the stuff that wasn't at the center of why I created the podcast in the first place. So I pressed pause on that. I abandoned the art. I didn't uh, I didn't mm, destroy true. it, I didn't get rid of it. I just pressed pause on it. And uh, I was waiting until the right time to feel galvanized to work on it again. And just when I felt ready to work on it again, this thing happened called COVID-19, which just, uh, you know, introduced some new projects into the mix, including Leadership Reinvented. But midway through the pandemic, I said, now is the time to revive it. I don't feel great about doing this virtually because I like the idea of us being in, in a studio. There was It was much more kinetic. It was much more personal. But I did it anyways, and we had some fantastic conversations. I like all of the season two virtual episodes. There's one episode in particular that stands out to me. Um, and I'll talk about it off air. There's, there's, there's a funny story that might not be uh, Okay, well, now, now I friendly. want to know about this more than anything in the world. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> Here, here's the teaser. There, there's one episode where Hamza is clearly... Uh, how do I say this? And mom, <laughs> if you're listening to this... Hey, here we go. Hamza was clearly under the influence of a psychedelic in one of those episodes. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my. Now, okay, is this like some sneak, this better not be some sneak promo for your podcast. Like everybody no, go no, no, find where Hamza's, go find that episode. Now I'm going to have to find that episode. It's the episode that goes off the rails in the best way possible. I couldn't have, I could not have asked for a better conversation. It was so much fun that we actually did a part two but we didn't record it. <laughs> and uh, I fully intend to bring this person back to the studio for season three. Now, season three, <laughs> we're not actually thinking about as a podcast. It is a full-fledged show. The payments have been made. Cool. The meetings have been had. The structure has been built. And man, it is everything you loved about season one on steroids. Everything you loved about season two on steroids with more clarity than I've ever had in any artistic project. I mean, this is really staying true to the idea of ideas into action, which is what is the idea that you are putting into action? And I ask no other question other than like, why did you start this? And we go from there. Why Why mm-hmm. did you, why is this the idea that you've dedicated your life to? And let's just explore it from every possible angle. So look out for that. That's going to be recorded <laughs> in the next few weeks. Well, I love that. And I love that uh, it's happening at the same time for both of us. Because, of course, I think that probably, I mean, a lot of this conversation, I'm not, probably sounds strange to some people. Like, everyone's relationship is different. And for us, I think we've been told by, on more than a number of occasions, it's a bit bizarre to have two speakers in the same relationship. We both think for a living. We both speak and literally talk on a podcast now. Because now that I have a podcast, I can say that I'm also a host. So... Okay, if we were doing it like, you know, me and you thinking, what do you think is the best and worst thing about being married to another expresser, if you will? Expresser of thoughts. First off, let's start with the worst thing. (laughs) (laughs) For me, it's the same thing. I think of a couple. (laughs) Why don't don't you go first? I I think I've got a a good answer here. Brewing. Of course. (laughs) there. Of course, it's bizarre sometimes, everyone. Like... So, you know how Hamza said that he's very intense and very serious? Well, 
sometimes you don't know like what the other person had, what the meeting they've just had, or maybe it's, they've just done some research on like some, like I said, very serious topics, though I don't take myself very seriously. And so maybe Hamza, you know, we're recording this on a Friday afternoon. Maybe he will walk out and he will be like, do you know how the Haymarket affair or how this line of research or how have you explored this? Do you know how this is affecting people's well-being today? And I will just be there like, so did you want a lychee in the martini? Like, <laughs> did, did you? Are, okay. Let me turn let me turn down my Mariah Carey Christmas music yeah, yeah, yeah. so I can give you the moment to dis- you look very That's distressed it. over there. Let's you gotta talk hear very about August seriously Bees and the Haymarket this. affair. Yeah. I yeah. Know. So occasionally one of but okay, that's a bit of a joke, but occasionally though, as one of the worst things is like there is a there is a line of seriousness to our work and sometimes mm-hmm. we both just need to get out of it and I can hear my mom's voice in my head right now saying, you know, just so you know, take a break, relax, you know, ease up, get back to that more playful side a little bit. Sure. And, uh, people might think that the worst thing was like traveling or, or, you know, you're on the road a lot, sometimes like three cities a week, but actually I would say it's more about making sure that the time you're together is, is like fun too, not just in the big serious problems that we're trying to solve every day. Right. Right. What about you? It's the, the, the best part and the worst part is the exact same thing. It's always on consistent professional development. So <laughs> that's, fair. Like, that's fair. Every time you learn, I learn. Every time I share anything, it is received by and then refracted by somebody who is as engaged with the subject matter, with learning, with growth and all of the things that we share in common. So that's the underrated part, which is like, I'm always learning. I'm always growing even when I don't want to. And I think that's the, <laughs> the downside <laughs> of it too. Cause there are some days where I just need someone to listen and emote lightly, but that's very, that's a lot to ask for me and for you, because when you hear something, you're so oriented by love and, and, uh, you know, your generosity of spirit to want to help me. And there's some t- some days where I just need to test material. There's some days where I just need to present a half formed idea, and you know, for <laughs> my my partner to just be like, "Cool story, bro," right? Uh, it reminds yeah, me of the scene fair. from Bab. <laughs> well, do you remember the scene? You, 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 we watched Babylon, right? We've watched everything together. Yeah. So remember the scene? It was like a, one of the one of the most chaotic scenes in the film where Brad Pitt's character is trying to make a career come back, and he's reading. Um, his lines for something to his uh, new wife and his new wife just critiques it and just offers like a scathing review and then he flips out, <laughs> throws shit and then actually, I think he shoots okay. her too. Wow. Like, oh okay, that's extreme. I know, I know. Like, that, that, that's what, extreme, right? What should I go like, okay. No, no, yeah. no, no, don't worry. Yeah, it's it's all good. But that's, that's the downside sometimes where um, I just need a compassionate... Um, and it, it, let me rephrase that because it's always compassionate and it's never well, judgy. Like it's always the, the, listen, the, I get it. the feedback is always offered, but I just want to find the correct way to phrase this in case other listeners and viewers find themselves in a similar relationship with somebody who offers constructive criticism to them by virtue of their subject matter expertise. There's well, a way like to said request it to me before. a throttle down. Like there's a, there's a, like, I think that you can request a version of reception that, um, provides the context to the receiver of the information to hold you and your ideas in a way that you need in that moment. And so for me, that dichotomy is like, this is a listen conversation, not a fixed conversation. And that's become the shorthand for us. Yeah. Yeah, everyone. So, you know, obviously I like talking. Here we are (laughs) near an hour later. But Hamza has definitely said to me on occasion, this is a listen conversation. Because I yeah. just can't help it. And I know people listening, I know a lot of you are like this too. When someone tells you something, instead of maybe an empathic response, you know, there's different kinds of responses to people in distress. We've got empathy, sympathy, educating, questioning. There's so many, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My defaults, and I say this when we teach this at Skills Camp, my defaults are definitely educating. I, I consider it an occupational hazard, but... <laughs> One of it is like, if Hamza tells me something, I'm immediately like, well, did you try this? Why don't we try this? Let's let's set up that. And I cannot help it. And so then sometimes he will say to me, this is a listen conversation. And honestly, 
it's quite hard. Like it actually is hard for me. So, but I love you. And I actually think that, you know, in my definition of love and if, if is to be better at that, because I think that part of love is helping the growth and development and learning of someone else for them, not for you. And, you know, like sure. we've talked about this before, like our definitions of love and whatnot. And so, you know, I would want to be better at that for you because I think it would help you in the long term. Mm -hmm. But as I suppose, as a form of expression, but of love, right? If we're tying together kind of the themes that we're talking about today. Truly, truly. Yeah. So, so in each episode, I'm going to have a bunch of segments and I'm going to have some segments that are permanent to each episode. And I'm also going to have some episodic segments, as you know, because I ask each guest to choose their favorite one that they want to talk about. So I, one that will be in every episode is called thought experiments. And okay. I'm going to, for with, with me and my guests, we're going to dive into a hypothetical situation related to the topics that we've talked about. Sure. And we're going to explore, you know, kind of different ideas, consequences, and possibilities really without the constraints of reality. You know, that kind of fun thought right, experiment. Right. Fun, fun fact, everyone listening, this will be its own segment in each episode. However, Hamza and I actually at one point, it was like a game in our relationship. We thought maybe we should just invite everyone to our thought experiments because we liked to think with people, hence how this podcast happened in the first place. But it would mm -hmm. be just like some kind of, let's throw it out there in left field. So I have one for you right now. We've been talking a lot about like expression and art. And really, I think expression is as old as humans itself. You know, I'm thinking humans and cave paintings. We were always finding a way to express. Oh, yeah. Right now, we're doing it through audio and video, you'd say. And that's been around for a long time. But let's pretend. Let's go like 50 years in the future. How do you think people will be expressing then? Like, what, how, like what's it going to look like? What do you think? Wow. I thought you were going to say like 5,000 years into the future. <gasps> Oh, we could do that. Or 500. Let's no, just go with 50. 50. I feel like it's attainable good, right? enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said, any advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I hope I'm getting yes. that right. And I think that the final form of communication as we know it today at least digital communication, but I would even lump all communication, offline communication to that as well. The final form of communication is telepathy. And I think that that's possible okay, in gonna our lifetime. you're going to have to explain lifetime. that one. <laughs> telepathy, like if we don't have to have, if we don't have to uh, orally express ourselves, if the thoughts that are in my mind are just synchronizing with you and all of the attendees simultaneously, and it's being received in the language that is native to them, if it's received with full context, if it's kind of like the, um, mm -hmm. you know, the aliens in Arrival, where they just draw those circles, which are just fascinating types of communication where everybody understands everything, everywhere, all at once, the full cycle, all the context, all the information is presented instantaneously. That, I think, is the final form of communication. Now, it seems like magic now. Thinking back to that Arthur C. Clarke quote that I shared earlier, any um, advanced technology, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It seems like magic now, but so did every other quantum leap in history. So did the phonetic alphabet. So did the television. So did the telegraph. So did the Gutenberg press. So did libraries. So did the internet. So did personal computers. So did the digital layer. So I think that this is possible and I feel emboldened to say that because we're living at a time of godlike technology, AI, which is a big focus of mm -hmm. your uh, research and, and work right now. It's Actually, curious. you did a presentation during the early days of Skills Camp that I still think about to this day. It really? Is, it was a, it was a, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it was actually from the same deck that uh, Sean Mullen referenced at the, shout out to Sean, during the Skills Camp Aww. holiday. Party. Sean is one of my facilitators was, at Skills Camp. Absolute legend. And and there was one slide, it was for the PAN network, where you talked about Which, the, the yeah. simple dynamics that compose successful communication. Full transmission, full receiving. And that's ultimately what we're focused on here when, we, when we're talking about expressing ourselves. Expression presupposes that there is an audience receiving. Now, not necessarily hmm. because you can express hmm. just for the sake of expressing. 
but I would count the ether as the receiver at that point. If there's no audience, then you're still like it's still emerging from something. It's going from <laughs> okay. one body to another body. If we're getting really abstract here, so so you want to say just, like the universe is the audience? Okay. Bingo, bingo, bango, bongo. <laughs> now we sure. might end up somewhere along the path to this outcome. You said fifty years. Yeah, fifty years. But you know, it's a thought experiment. So let's be experimental. Wow. I honestly think we're probably going to get there in the, in the next twenty. Like we, we have near instant internet speed. We have huh. more cell phones than people on the planet. Last I checked, more at least more devices mm -hmm. than people on the planet. And we are now in the beginning stages of neural implants. The experiments are going terribly. Look you into them. What? Look at what's happening with uh, Elon Musk and the chimps. It'll, it'll give you nightmares. But we're at the big, we're at the beginning stages of it right now. And of course, AI assisted and AI powered communication will support full message transmission and receiving. Hmm. If not telepathically, then damn near telepathically in the next twenty to fifty years. You know, when you first say that, I think I people. Really that's why I said you're probably going to have to explain that to everyone listening, but actually, I also don't think that it's completely far out because as you've noted, two texts that are simultaneously developing. And as a complete side note, because some people listening might not actually know my career outside of this, right now I'm doing a doctorate and I study generative AI and how it could and should be used to basically support humanity um, and skills development and stuff like that. So along, So there you've got one, you've got generative AI where I can already tell it exactly what's in my head, as you know, we've done just for delight on a weekend, just say like, can you create this visual? And we, with more and more detail, we've been able to get it closer and closer to what's in our head. That's just upon year one of gen, public release of Gen AI. Then alongside it, as you've noted, you've got the development of neural implants, and that is also on its way. The fact that that's already happening, maybe for everyone listening, makes 50 years seem a lot less wild. The minute those start communicating with each other, things start getting smaller. Now, does that also have some terrifying consequences? Yes, there are some elements of that that kind of freak me out. But that was not the thought experiment for today. So, mm -hmm. so then expressing with art. Do you think it'll just be like to attend a show? Would it be that you're just in the presence of someone and they just think things to you? Like, where are we going with this? I love yeah, it. This is, a, this, this is also a big reason why I'm leaning into art early because I think it is the final form. Wow, I can't believe we're about to go here. I would expect nothing less from let's think this through with Bailey Parnell. Uh, right? You're stretching I mean, my thinking Good. To the final degree, like you're, you're taking me to the final form. What is going to happen? And I hmm. believe it's going to happen in my soul so much so that I've dedicated every waking hour of my life to it. Like you have to, you have to keep in mind, like Hamza wakes up, thinks about this problem, works on this problem and goes to sleep and has dreams about this problem. And the problem is the world of work is no longer serving us. The world of work has approached the end of its utility. Like we need to shed the style of work that has brought humanity to this junction in history and introduce a new system that will bring us to a post-work world. Hear me out. By no later than 2030, any job that can be automated will be automated. And so if there is a part of your job right now, I'm speaking to every listener, every viewer, if there's a part of your job that is scalable, measurable, and repeatable, best believe there's going to be an algorithm, a robot, some tireless device or system that will be able to do that job better than you. And that includes me as well. There's at least 70% of my day that could be done better by an AI tool, an AI assisted thing. What does that mean for us? If we play our cards right, humanity has a real chance of ushering in a post-work world. Now that's a huge paradigm shift for a lot of people, including our friends and our family, especially mm -hmm. my family that might be listening to this right now, because their entire paradigm from the day they were born was that people engage in productive labor, people engage in work. I don't think my dad and my mom can understand a world without work. I don't think they can understand how that might work. But you and I, because we have the privilege of the education and the access that we have, we can visualize how maybe introducing something like UBI to offset the gains in uh, inefficiency, um, you know, how, how a greater cooperation globally, how a consciousness elevation for 
uh, the future of humanity could usher in a world in which we're, we have the privilege to engage in to engage in leisure all the time, to engage in education all the time, or whenever we choose to, to engage in adventure, to engage in passionate, purposeful activities. That might very well happen in the next century. I'm optimistic that we can get there, but mm -hmm. at the same time, it is disheartening to open up any social media platform or any news outlet in 2023 on the eve of 2024 and be like, how the F are we going to get from this moment in time to that? But that's where you and I and now this community of let's think this through listeners and viewers My thinking come buddies. into play. There we go. The, is that is that the name? So I got the action faction. You got the thinking buddies. This is this is where the, the thinking buddies the, come in. Like, <laughs> sure, you're you're my number one. But hey. um, and of course, cheers to that man. Also, my number one drinking buddy. That's for hey. sure. But um, okay, so there's a lot going on there. I mean, that is sure, definitely its own. It's no, 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 never. But its own full podcast, I think, is like the future of work. I mean, it's literally a category of, of speaking and whatnot because everyone's got opinions on it. And I also believe that AI could usher in a better, more utopic world for people. And, you know, when I say this to some, they think, yeah, they think we think of all the barriers, right? We think of the things that like, like capitalism, like greed that come in and make people say that will never happen. Or maybe their distrust of governments comes in, or maybe they've seen the way that people have misused technology before. And that is all correct. Like that is all valid. And I also say, well, who benefits when you think it can't be done? You know, who benefits, you know, talking to like, as you know, where we are now and the, the kind of work we do now is very different than yeah. the kind of work that our career started as. It was very, yeah. very different and, and that our family does today. And so, you know, I say, you know, who benefits when we think that there's no version of this where your life gets easier and you're still taken care of. And let me tell you, it's not us. It's not us that benefits when you think it can't be done and it's not them. Absolutely not. And like there's there's so much more I want to riff on just this idea, but I actually want to like tie up the the question. Yeah, you still have tie my answer back you, to the question. I didn't forget. You still have to answer. We're not attending concerts in fifty yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Am I just showing up in your presence and are sure. people translating their thoughts to me? <laughs> one one of the reasons I'm so obsessed with Oppenheimer is because Christopher Nolan, the genius that he is, convinced people to sit in a theater for three hours and not see a single punch, not see a single car chase, not see a single gun go off, not see a single transformer, not see Dominic Toretto show up and be like, get in, we gotta save the family. Like family. this was, family. we watched guys sitting around a table talking for three hours straight, riveted. I mean, it's gonna win Oscars. It has made all the money in the world. Mm. It's made me into a super fan. And I'm like, how did this happen? This happened because I believe that in the post work world, in the post AI assisted world, once we figured out how everybody can create freely using prompts, using AI tools, a premium will be placed on authentic human experiences, genuine human connection. Yeah offline experiences and so yes there's going to be a version that's going to happen very soon it's already we're seeing glimpses of it with these virtual co virtual concerts right i got to attend a couple of Fortnite concerts i've done vr concerts uh you know silent concerts like we're, we're experimenting with new modes of engaging in that experience but there's something to me at least that's romantic about being in the presence sharing the same air as an artist like i went to go see drake recently it was me i was there by myself I'm going to flex a little bit over here, general admission to watch Drake. And I got up close. Like it was me and Drake like five feet away. And there I am wilding out. I'm just having the greatest time. And I'm like, it was special because it was full transmission from the artist to me. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, yes, yes, I do. I see that. I definitely Sorry, think. Let me just add one more thing. If, if. Yeah, yeah. It, it, in lieu of telepathy there would still have to be an intermediary that isn't air. That's what I'm trying to say. Hmm. Hmm. No, 100%. I think that there will be some premium placed on human experiences. Um, I, you know, let's wait for another podcast to discuss, you know, can AI express and create art and, you know, all that sort of stuff too. Sure. But, um, you know, I think that, like I said, could be its own episode. 
So, but okay. we will, we will kind of steer it towards a close slowly but surely. And wow. you know, we're going to go into the, we the episode. End? Um, well, I, I think so. But fortunately for Jeez, you, man. you like just live started, with man. me. And we can go talk about it after we're done recording. Shout out to you. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I know a but, place nearby. Yeah. <laughs> it's called our living room meets kitchen meets dining room because it's all the same hey, place in New York. I was thinking <laughs> and, pizza um, spot, but we can do that too. Okay. Okay, sure. So episodic segment that you chose because in every episode, everyone, I'm going to let the guests choose from about six thinking segments. So there's overthinking, there's quick thinking, there's baby thinking, and you chose wishful thinking. So we're going to mm. do some wishful thinking where this. we'll discuss right. some hopes, dreams, aspirations related to one of the episode's topics. Even if they seem completely idealistic, even if they seem far-fetched, and it's kind of like a space for optimistic speculation and sharing of personal desires. And so I think something perfect for, you know, the first this my first episode, but also the fact that we talked about your podcast with regards to our shows, what would be your farthest reaching dream or aspiration? And by the way, I can understand this can be a little bit kind of scary or vulnerable to say this out loud because I'm on episode one. So talk to me in a year, perhaps I will have failed miserably, but you know what? You have to try. Wishful thinking, Ooh. best case scenario for your show. Wow, are you asking for, for, for this show or like, my general far-reaching dream or aspiration no for let's do your podcast your show for the podcast to know to, to not have a need to exist anymore because everybody knows the ideas everybody knows the people everybody knows the guiding ethos powering the mm. podcast that exists in the world and therefore this thing doesn't need to be created there's no demand for it anymore that would be my furthest reaching dream or aspiration. Wow. I guess yeah, that's well, the, kind of makes a sense. Saying, I don't, in a well, way. I don't, know, I don't know who said it, but like the, the saying is the most sustainable business is one that doesn't need to exist. And I think about that a lot. It's like the, it's, it's the oh business gosh, equivalent. Oh my gosh, I say that all the time about my own business. Well, wait, wait, you it's, know. It's the, right, right, right. It's, it's the business equivalent of the leadership advice that you and I subscribe to, which is a leader's job is to make themselves off, obsolete. So that's yeah. at least what I envision for the show. But if you ask me, like, what is my furthest reaching dream or aspiration in general? Like, that's prepare for an <laughs> outlandish answer. We, if we, we have time have for to, it. We probably we need like another hour for that. I can I can get it down to one minute, but yeah. I'll oh, be. okay. Well, then uh, now we need to know. So farthest reaching, like you're, you're talking wishful thinking for your life? For my life, your life, the life of our kids, um, the life of everyone period. I, there's Ooh, there's that's no big doubt. Thinking. What do you think? E what ev is it? Every, e there, there's no doubt in the scientific community that in 5 billion years, the earth is going to end. So like, just <laughs> like, think about that for a second, right? Like every person who's ever lived, every piece yes. of art created, every expression, every book written, every song composed will end for sure in 5 billion years. The sun is going to reach the end of its life cycle and engulf earth. So we actually have an imperative five winks just for that. We have an imperative <laughs> to get off the planet, to explore space. And I would say like 5 billion is, 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 it's the final cutoff. We actually have to get off by in the next 1 billion years because earth will become inhospitable. It'll, it'll resemble something between Dune and Mad Max in a billion years. <laughs> okay. So, so we're, we when are actually we at need the wishful part of this thinking. Here, oh, here we are. Here <laughs> because we are. right now the, the world's the, dying. So let's bring it up. Hear me out. <laughs> The wishful, wishful part of my thinking is that we all use our time as the Thinking Buddy community to usher in Aww, a world, cute. to shape yeah, a world. I like it. Let's let's think together. Let's think this through. How do we create a world that has transcended poverty, ignorance, and vulnerability, so that the garden of humanity can sprout better ideas that'll get us from this moment in time to the far-fetched but very realistic and actually urgent goal of interplanetary travel. I know there's people listening to this right now who are like, hey man, like I I'm just an analyst for this, you know, company. I I just, you know, I you know, I'm an athlete or, you know, I'm, I'm a content creator or I'm a professor. I'm like, it doesn't matter what you do. We actually need to all think 
collectively about how to get off the planet because that's going to happen. The person that you love right now, extrapolate that chain mm. of humanity a billion years into the future, that person's going to suffer. That person's going to die. It's all going to be for nothing. So if we want to actually continue this great experiment that is humanity, we have to get past the very primitive problems that we're experiencing in 2023 and somehow upgrade our primitive brains, our medieval institutions to synchronize with the God, God-like technology that we have today. And it can be done. We are at that moment. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's happening right now. So that's my so, wild hope. That and, and, and let me just add one thing here. If anybody thinks it cannot be done, let me remind you, and this is, I'm just, I'm going to, mm-hmm. you're getting an exclusive. One of the big features of my next book is the long history that humans have shared with big cats. It's wild to go from burnout to modern (laughs) leadership to humans getting effed up by big cats for (laughs) 4 million years. But imagine that for a second. Are you sure there's not something in that coffee? (laughs) I thought that was creamer. Could have been Bailey's. I don't know. (laughs) No, it's not. For, for 4 million years, humans were tyrannized by lions. Like it just, so much of our modern evolutionary vestiges are a reflection of that tension over 4 million years, but we figured it out. And you know how we figured it out? We figured it out through cooperation, through egalitarianism, through love, through expression. And we okay, can do so it again. Is what you're saying, Hums, if I'm, if I'm hearing this correctly, and I don't know, Talk maybe everyone me. else is too. I'm so hyped now. You're saying we need to think through some things together. Get it? Yes. Yes. Okay. We need to absolutely think through some things and we need every well, human being on the planet to do this. AKA read between the lines. We need everybody to be healthy, to feel like they belong, to thrive. They need to transcend poverty, ignorance, and vulnerability holistically. That's how we harness the full spectrum of the human experiment that is you know, mm-hmm. at least 4 million years in the making. Well, that is v- extremely wishful thinking. And I think that's a good place to bring it to the closing, what will be the closing segment on on every episode. And that's what's called train of thought. So Ooh. near the end Banger. of each episode, I'm going to ask each guest to sum up the theme or the central topic of our conversation that stood out for them. <laughs> and then on the next episode, that, that guest... <laughs> is gonna have to connect their topic to the last one in an ongoing train of thought. So since this is the first episode, Hums, you will begin the train of thought for the entire show, no small feat, no pressure. So how would you wanna sum up this conversation or the major theme? And then on my next episode, that guest, who I happen to know is doing a cocktail with me, that guest will have to connect their episode to this in a very creative way. So that's a long way of saying, what do you think is the central theme or topic? And wow, you did you talk are... about both the planet dying. You talked about <laughs> bad, I mean, MVP you really went a lot of directions. And... <laughs> wait, wait, wait. But, 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 but this is a good challenge, right? The, and this is the challenge of thought leaders, of thinkers, of educators, of academics, of anybody engaged in idea generation and expression. The onus is on us to simplify the ideas, to make them as accessible as possible, right? So it's start good the train for of the thought. audience. It's good for me as well. I subscribe to the Lewinian school of thought when it comes to human behavior. I believe that human behavior is the result of an interplay between a person and their environment. And if we're thinking about the conditions that created us, it's safe to say that humans have a hard-coded fear of unknown environments. And Therefore, you can extrapolate from that, we have a fear of change. We are actually resistant to change. During times of change, you and I and every other human who's ever existed has at least felt a modicum of resistance to the change and has therefore engaged in a modicum of a short-term guided, a a, a short-term decision-making process that is in their best interest, that's survival driven, but it's often at odds with what's in the best interest of the collective, of what's in the best interest of the environment. It's actually a vicious cycle. So we basically like, let's just put it this way. We're afraid yeah, of change me, during times of change and transition. Let me encourage you to sum this up very quickly because I'm gonna have to okay. give this to got the you, next guest in a very short, we talked about expression. <laughs> I got you, I got you. There's only two emotions. There's love and then there's fear. 
And this is not even an original idea. This was best encapsulated by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, best known for the five stages of grief and other works. Uh, her quote is that there's only two emotions, love and fear. All positive emotions come from love. All negative emotions come from fear. And I would argue that modern civilization has been built by and in response to a long history of fear dating as far back as the first prey predator interaction between a big cat and our earliest ancestors on the African savanna. So the big idea that I have for you is pick as counterintuitive as it feels in every moment, love over fear. That's how okay. we change ourselves. That's how we change systems. And that's how we ultimately change the world. You know what? That is a perfect first idea to lead the train of thought throughout, throughout the rest of the show. And I think it's also a perfect closing thought as well, because we are wrapping up here. And even though we talked about, you know, the podcast talked about even, you know, what it's like to be married to each other to some degree, though, eh, I'm sure we'll be talking about that for ages and expression and AI and putting art on ice. Um, I think all of it, it does come down to an expression of love. So as I move through this podcast, you will always and forever be guest number one. So thank you. Even though you're my husband, you know, I still like, I learned a bunch about you just in this hour together. And, and maybe every couple should do this together, just like podcast host each other. And I also, um, of course, have endless gratitude for you because thank you. you don't have to do this. You'd still be married to me. So thank you for coming. And I love you. I love you too. I'm proud of you. I'm excited to subscribe, to listen, to share, and to, wow, in a hundred, in a thousand, a million episodes later, actually hear and see the progression of thought from this first dichotomy that uh, you have honored me by, by, by kicking off. Yeah, Thank well, you. you know what? Hopefully there is a progression because... Everyone listening who got to the end of episode one, hopefully there will be a big payoff for you at the end of episode 100 because I plan on only getting better at this, not getting worse. We might just think this through. We might just think through the challenge of how to get off the planet. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, optimistic. Yeah. I think we've, we've started yeah. a chain reaction through this conversation. Thank you everyone for listening and you'll hear from me again soon. 